A set is a collection of objects. For example, if you have a pen, pencil and paper in your backpack, then that will make a set. And what we do is we indicate it like this, we say pen, pencil, paper, well, the order doesn't really matter, but we separate the different objects by commas and we indicate curly braces at the ends to say this is what the set is. Okay, so sets can have objects that are very abstract or arbitrary. For example, you can have a set of numbers, for example, 2, 3, 11. This is also a set. You can have a set which consists of numbers, animals, objects, etc. So, for example, you can have something like 7, 11, um, backpack and you can also have cow. Okay, this is also considered a set. So sets are just means of collecting things. Okay, so you have these abstract objects, you want to collect them all into a set and you denote it like this. Now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a really weird paradox, very famous paradox called Russell's paradox in this video. And in order to do that, I'm first going to start going on with what kinds of sets we can construct. So to give you an idea, we can construct some pretty abstract sets. For example, we can throw in a set as being an object in another set. So here I've denoted some sets. We can have another set where what we do is we take this set, 2, 3, 11, and we have the other objects or whatever objects we like. Okay, so for example, we could have 2, 3, 11, pen and apple, and that also consists of is that also can that is also a set basically a collection of objects now the paradox is going to be that as we keep doing this we're going to run into some issue okay and pretty weird issue so this is a set now sometimes when we have sets we denote them by letters okay so for example we say x this denotes a set x so i've indicated that so in this context we call this x we can say this is y we can say this is z we could say this is a okay so these are all examples of sets now, when you have a set, you can construct other sets, okay? So, there are many different ways of doing this, but I'm going to consider one particular way of doing this, um, which is the following. And the way is basically specifying a property that members in the set must satisfy, okay? So, we're going to get into that. So, what property? So, for example, if I take the set consisting of pen, pencil, and paper, then and, and, and some numbers, then I can consider all elements in the set that satisfy the property of being a number. So for example, let me take the set X. Okay, I'm redefining a new set, okay? So we're calling it X. I'm going to say it consists of pen, pencil, and some numbers, 3, 7, 12, and an eraser, okay? So just a random set. Now, suppose I want to consider all the objects in this set that satisfy a certain property, the property of being a number. So how, here's how I would denote it, okay? So first, I want to indicate to you how you denote membership, okay? So what does it mean for something to be a member of X? It means it's in the set X, okay? So what we do is we denote it by the following. We say pen is inside X. We use this symbol here to denote that pen is a member of X or what we call an element of X, okay? Now, we can also say, for example, that 3 is also a member of X, okay? So we denote this by the symbol which just says 3 is a member of X. Now, sometimes some things are not members of X. In fact, most things aren't because there are so many objects out there. So you could have a number like zero. Zero is not in X. So what we do is we put a line there to say zero is not in X. Now, these are, this is what is called membership. Now, I'm going to define a new set from X, okay? And as I said, it's going to be all the things in X that are numbers. Here's a cool way of writing that. So I'm going to erase this from the board and I'm going to consider the following. So I'm going to consider all things in X that are not numbers. Oh, there are numbers, sorry. So here I'm going to consider all things. So let's say, let's call it Y. Y is the set of all things in X. Okay, so it's the set of all X in X such that X is a number. Okay, that's what we, that's what we call Y. Okay, so what this means basically, so this is a meaning, some new notation I'm introducing. We basically want to say all the things that are in X, which we have pen, pencil, 3, 7, 12, and eraser, and all the things that are n a number. Okay, so that restricts some things in X. So this is just going to be 3, 7, 12. Okay, We're just excluding everything that's not a number, or in other words, including everything that is a number. Okay, so that is the set Y. So this is a notation, okay? So when you have a set, you can consider all the things in the set that satisfy this nice property or whatever property you like. Now, once you've got this far, I'm gonna tell you the paradox, which is, can we keep going with this process and construct some weird sets? Um, and do we run into any logical inconsistencies, okay? So this is what is called a paradox, is a logical inconsistency. And I'm gonna talk about that. 
So a paradox is basically a, the classic example of a paradox is the so-called liar paradox, okay? So the liar paradox says that, for example, suppose I make a statement right now that I am lying, okay? So right now I'm making a statement. This statement is a lie. Okay, this statement is a lie. Okay, so this statement is false. Okay, so here's a statement. Now, the paradox is, is the statement true or is it false? So there are two possibilities, right? It should either be true or false, right? So let's, cons let's say it's true. Okay, if it's true, that means that the statement is a lie. But that means it's false, right? So that's, that's an inconsistency. Okay, so it can't be true. Is it false? That's the other possibility. So we can consider, is this statement false? Well, if the statement is false, then that means it's not a lie because the statement is saying it's, the statement is a lie. It's not a lie, but that means it's true. But that's also an inconsistency, okay? So either way, it's an inconsistency. This is what we call a paradox, that any possibility leads to a logical inconsistency. So this is the liar paradox. Now, I'm gonna show you a paradox that will arise if we try to make sets in the process I've just told you, which seems, you know, like a very normal process, just collecting things. And once you've collected a bunch of things, taking all the things with a certain property within that bunch, that's gonna to lead to a paradox, okay? And what is the paradox gonna be? Uh, it is what is called Russell's paradox, okay? So a very famous paradox in math, okay? It's by Russell, he's a very famous uh, philosopher, mathematician. So here's what the paradox is. I'm going to construct a set, okay? What I'm going to do is assume you can take the set of all sets. Makes sense, right? You just have a set that, that has everything, okay? Like every, every set's in it. You're just going to collect all the objects, okay? Let's consider the following um, elements of the set that have a property, okay? So we're going to consider um, all sets, okay? All sets x such that x is not a member of x. Okay, so we're going to call this set Y. Okay, so it's all sets that are not a member of themselves. Now, you may ask, what does it even mean for a set to be a member of itself? I mean, that's a little bit weird, right? But I'll talk about that after. So watch till the end for that. I'll explain how that can arise, okay? But we're just going to consider, I mean, you can define it, right? You can say all sets so that it's not a member of itself, right? And um, whatever that means, you can ask, is this a set? Um, now, here's the paradox, okay? Here's what's Russell's paradox. Y has to either be a member of itself or not, right? Like we saw in the first examples. If you, if you have something, it's either in the set or it isn't, right? So Y itself, okay, so there are two possibilities. Y is in Y or Y is not in Y. Okay, those are the two possibilities. Now, if Y is in Y, what that means is that Y is a set, and, and don't worry if it takes time to get your head around this, okay? It's just, it's part of the process, but it's a famous paradox, okay? So I'm trying to explain this. It's actually very basic at its core. It's just about getting used to stuff. If Y is in Y, that means Y is a set that is not in itself, right? That's what it means to be in Y, okay? It's all the sets that are not in themselves. So if Y is in Y, that means Y has to not be in Y. Because it is in Y. That's the definition of Y. It's all the sets that are not in themselves. That, that's, that's an inconsistency, right? That's an inconsistency. What if Y is not in Y? Well, if Y is not in Y, that means it's a set that is a member of itself. So that means that Y has to be in Y, which is also a logical inconsistency. So either way, we've reached an inconsistency. So this is what we call Russell's paradox. Okay, so it's a famous Russell's paradox. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you another example. So if you're trying to get your head around this, I'm going to show you another example, which is exactly the same kind of paradox, basically. Russell type paradox, we say. It's a Barber's paradox, okay? It's very famous, too. It's very colloquial. Let's consider Barber's, okay? You have a bar Let's consider a Barber who only shaves people who don't shave themselves, okay? So the Barber only shaves people who, does it, who don't shave themselves. Here's the question. Does the barber shave himself or not? Now, this is again a paradox, okay? Because if the barber shaves himself, he only shaves people who don't shave themselves. So if he shaves himself, that means he doesn't shave himself. That's absurd. And if he doesn't shave himself, then, um, well, he only shaves people who don't shave themselves. So if he doesn't shave himself, that means he has to shave himself. That's also absurd. 
So either way, there is a inconsistency. There's a paradox. So how do we explain the paradox? I want you to drop a comment down below what you think. How do we explain these paradoxes? So I'll tell you the paradox, but I want you to drop a comment. I want you to think about what, what's going wrong with these things, okay? So what is going wrong is that actually such a barber doesn't exist, okay? If, it, if, if the barber exists, if he exists, then there is a paradox. So actually the answer is he doesn't exist, okay? There's no such barber. It's the same thing with Russell's paradox, which is why I brought it up. There is, no set, there is no set of all sets that are not a member of themselves, okay? So there is an inconsistency there. So that is why in, in this, this is a subject called set theory, collecting these objects and finding laws of creating more sets from old ones, you have to be very careful about how you do it. You can't just do it as you wish. And this is what Russell's paradox shows. And I'm gonna end the video with a very important comment which confuses a lot of people with Russell's paradox. What does it even mean for a set to be in itself, right? So here's an example. I'm gonna give you two examples, both of which will, should convince you, maybe give you a sense of what this looks like. So example one is suppose I have the set just consisting of one, okay? So this set, one is not in, the, the set is not in itself, okay? So of course one is a member of the set, right? Because it's a set consisting of just one. But the set itself is one, is not a member of itself. Right? If I made a new set, suppose I made a new set that said one comma one. Okay? This set, one is a member of itself. Oh, sorry, one is not a member of itself, one is a member of this set. So one, just the set consisting of one, which is different from the number one. Right? The set consisting of one is, just, is a set, it consists of one, and that set is a member of this bigger set. Okay? Um, which is um, consisting of one and one. Okay, so this is an idea that you have to try to get try to get your head around is that one is not a member of this, but of course one is a member of this. Okay, so to be a member of something, it literally has to be included in the list. Okay, that's all there is to it. Now, why I bring this up is because we can make the following weird kind of paradox, which is that, well, not paradox, but weird construction. We can create a set that is a member of itself. Okay, it seems like you can't because now you get one is in this. But this whole set itself, right, consisting of one and one, is not, right? It's not inside one, one, because literally it's not a member of itself. So this is kind of the thing. For a set to be in itself, it has to kind of be bigger, it seems, right? It, it can't contain itself unless it's even bigger than what it was, which doesn't, which is a logical, doesn't make sense. But here's an example. Okay, suppose I try to make a rule, okay? This is like an infinite nested radical, which I've done a video on in my channel, check it out, okay? It's a very similar idea. Suppose I try to make a rule to say x is equal to one comma x. Okay, I'm trying to form a set x with this property. Then if I keep repeating this, right? This is going to be one comma one comma x. Just by replacing the first x with a one comma x. Then I can keep going with this, okay? And the point is that if I then keep going with this and get one comma one comma x, I keep going with this forever, the set x is going to equal to the following construction. It's like an infinite construction. It just keeps going like this forever. And that's what our set x is. And it is a member of itself because if you look at this, right? Um, to say x is a member of itself, well, if you remove, the point is if you remove one of this, right? If you remove the one comma, this part of it, you get back x, right? So just from this, you can see from here, up here, x is a member of itself, right? So it's a weird set, but in, so this is like, you know, in set theory, there are axioms that preclude this, okay? It's called the regularity axiom. It precludes sets from being members of themselves. So it doesn't allow constructions like this. So there are a number of ways of handling Russell's paradox. I won't get into that in this video, but I wanted to show you what it is right from scratch. Um, you know, if you're not used to it, there's some logical puzzle kind of thinking, but you can always watch over parts of the video and let me know down in the comments below if you have any questions. I'd be very happy to answer. I wanted to introduce you to this famous paradox if you haven't seen it and just to get a feel for it and, you know, drop a comment down below, you know, how you, why you think it's not a paradox. I've sort of given a reason, but why you think it's a par, uh, you know, why there's no logical inconsistency, etc. And I have a video on the infinite nested radical where I do some, some similar construction like this, which is root one plus root one plus root one, etc. So you can construct numbers like that, which is like root of one plus root of one plus root of one, etc. But constructing sets like this is leading to problems. So it shows you 
how kind of delicate the subject is. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I wish you all the best. I'm so happy you watched this far. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Everyone asks for it on YouTube, but I'm trying to create infinite elite math education to help as many people as possible. You know, all of this stuff is free. So all you have to do is like and subscribe. It helps motivate me and spread out my channel to more people so I can grow and help as many people as possible. So check out my channel, lots of cool content, and I'm super excited to see you in the next video.